Uh, just while we're settling in, I want to um, take a moment just for a quick uh, promotional advert here. Uh, you may have noticed that the lovely Stuart Bailey is at the back with um, Dig With It, which, if you haven't seen it before, is a fantastic um, roundup of everything that's happening in music in Northern Ireland, be that the, um, the latest record store sound advice that's opened up, whether it's what's happening in the prize, to new music coming out, new releases, you can subscribe to it online at Dig With It. And um, yeah, I think it's quarterly. They release it, but Stuart will keep you right. But yeah, for a mere five pounds, you can keep yourself fully up to date with what is happening in the Northern Ireland music scene. So yeah, Stuart's at the back. Give him a There you go, Stuart. Um, so thanks everyone for, for staying. I know it can seem like a long day when it's panel after panel, but thank you so much. And for anyone that's just joined, my name's Lynn, part of Music Connections, and for anyone watching online, including Joel Harkin, who I know is gutted couldn't be here. Um, for this session on uh, streaming and the online music economy. Um, you're all very, very welcome. Uh, I'm going to say no more than that. I'm going to hand over to Brian Coney, who's moderating the panel, and he will introduce the various people on the panel. And again, I just want to thank you for being here and thank our panellists for being here as well and giving up their time. They bring a wealth of expertise and I'm very much looking forward to this session. So Brian, over to you. Thank you so much, Lynn, and thank you for everyone who has came and has stayed after the last panel. That was really interesting. Um, the phone cab guy getting up was a real sort of thing out of the blue. I enjoyed that. Um, I got a phone cab over here, so they're still they're actually operating. I can assure you. Um, so today, uh, Music City's afternoon. We've got four or five different panels, and it's leading up to the Northern Ireland Music Prize later. That should be fun. Who do we think is going to win? Joshua Burnside, there we go. Um, so today, I am hosting the panel with three fantastic people, incredibly informed individuals in the industry, working across different parts of the industry as well. And it is about asking one question, which has many tiers and many answers. And it is online music economy. The online music economy, does it all add up? Now, over the last two years, needless to say, music has been a huge safe haven for all of us. And for many of us, that has um, been streaming based. There's no doubt about it. Streaming has been incredibly important for a lot of individuals. Obviously, with the live industry at its knees and record shops not operating, we have all sort of resorted to uh, you know, Spotify and the likes more than we probably would have before the, the pandemic hit. And fault lines were obviously revealed as a result of that in, in terms of certain things that needs bridged in the industry and in terms of the online music economy. Today we have three people to make sense of what has happened in the last two years and also what is going to happen in the next two, three to five years and onwards and what we can all do to make it a viable industry for artists and producers of music, such as DJs. Um, so first up, I would like to introduce Graham Best. Just on the far side, Graham is the senior director of the platform operations company, the audio rights management company, Song Trader. It's the largest business to business music licensing marketplace in the world. They have over 500,000 artists from 190 countries, and I'm sure that's growing day by day. And Graham has had a wealth of experience in various other parts of the industry. We have Nadia Khan and she has had over 20 years experience in the industry in management, marketing, and strategy. And Nadia is not only the chair of the Association of Independent Music, she is the founder of Women in Control, which is a vital nonprofit organization set up to inspire and empower women in the music industry. And finally, we have uh, an individual who I'm sure many of you will recognize. He is uh, Ivor Novello winning twice artist Grammy nominated artist and an incredible songwriter, Mr. Ian Archer. And Ian has been a very active spokesperson in relation to the ethics of music streaming over the last six or seven months. And we'll talk about that briefly. Um, could you just give them a brief, uh, not brief, a warm welcome, please? <laughs> Don't make it brief, make it long. Yeah. Thank you. 
That was pretty brief, actually. Thank you. So I want to start off with uh, a question involving in the audience. You don't have to say anything, just with a, a brief show of hands. Um, can you tell me, do you use streaming services? So, excellent. Um, secondarily, do you feel that streaming services could work better with artists, independent artists, um, to monetize and um, propel their career? Okay. Now, that wasn't a, a way to create a sort of a, a negative sort of beginning to say that streaming's all bad. It's just a way to sort of lead into, I think, an important point, which is that there are so many pros to streaming, of course, but there are some things that need fixed. We're just going to we're going to touch on streaming before we move on to other parts of the online music industry. Ian, you were an active and and very uh, involved individual with the DCMS um, inquiry in Westminster earlier this year. Can you tell us a little bit about that? How that came about and what the outcomes of that was? Yeah. Uh, so for the last three years, I've sat on the songwriting committee, songwriters committee at the Irish Academy and uh, just been voted on to the new Senate at the Irish. Um, and so I guess via my involvement, we're heavily involved in campaigning in general for songwriters rights and uh, on, on many of these issues. Um, so that is probably a very strong point of contact in how I got involved. Um, but uh, Tom Gray, who uh, if anybody who's familiar with the, the Broken Record campaign, um, uh, Tom and I have been discussing these issues for a long time, previous to Broken Record launching as a, as a thing, which was essentially Tom just pointing out a few of the inequities that exist within the industry, and it, it very quickly proved to be a, a mega touchstone um, for for huge amounts of creators in in the UK and, and, and much much wider um, so uh, Tom being a, a, a brilliantly particular politically galvanized human um, has 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 off the back of that energy really created an awful lot of momentum and we now have uh, this great political momentum. Um, so the DCMS inquiry really, really emerged as, you know, in, in some way, uh, as that, as that debate started to heighten, there was an awareness that this really needs to be dealt with at a, at a governmental level because there is so much intransigence and, and, and I think a lack of will to, to have a genuinely creative conversation, plotting, like you say, five years, I think even 10 years down the line to what sort of music ecosystem we want to have. Do we want to asset strip it or do we want to, or resource strip it or for, for creators or do we genuinely want to feed back in and have a bunch of new creators coming in now who are thriving in, in five, 10, 15, 20 years time. Um, I think there's a real concern that that's not the case at the moment and, and it's not going in the right direction, especially with uh, the news this week. Um, so so that, that, that uh, I was then given the opportunity to submit evidence to the inquiry um, and I, I, Cobalt, my publishers, were incredibly helpful in collating some really hard and fast data that I could submit. It's available to be seen. It's 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 out there on the DCMS inquiries report, um, and and really revealed the, the what I see what what my kind of income streaming income is song to song over the years. Um, so I welcomed that and I stuck my name at the bottom of my evidence and it went in and they managed to sort of stick it slap bang in the middle of the report, which was, uh, yeah, which th th then, you know, um, gives you a certain amount of attention on these issues, but I'm really happy to sort of, you know, put my head up above the parapet and talk about it. I think a lot of people are very reluctant to because of the fear that actually 
there's an industry environment that we could be punished for that. And I think it's really important, even just at this point of the conversation, to say, I really love working with all facets of the music industry. There are so many great people, and genuinely pretty much everybody I know wants to help artists and wants to make it a better thing. So it's not like you want to bash any of, yeah. of these people in the head. It's trying to open up a dialogue to say, where are we going? You know, what's yeah. next? Thank you. That's well said. Um, now, Nadia, you are, you've, as I said at the start, you've been working for over 20 years in the industry and, and various facets of it. Um, so Nadia flew in from London today. Um, she's half Northern Irish, so she grasps it from you know uh, a Northern Irish perspective, but also the bigger picture. So as chair of AIM and also um, the founder, Women in Control, I just want to touch on it briefly from a streaming perspective before moving on. How can audiences empower independent artists that you've been working with and any number of artists beyond um, in this sort of sort of strange no man's land of, of, um, of streaming at the moment? Yeah, I think it's um, been really interesting kind of, you know, as you said, working in the industry for over 20 years and just seeing how the landscape has changed and having to really rethink completely how we release music and you know um in the first kind of decade of my career I was releasing music independently and as a manager running artist label businesses and managed to chart a lot of records independently and then when streaming came about it was kind of like you say a no man's land and everyone that we were working with from independence to majors it felt like everyone felt like we had to relearn how we um, promote music and how we run campaigns um so you know streaming as you as you mentioned has become such a huge part of um artists and right holders revenues um but obviously this debate has come up and rightly so i think you know we i, I said like um, ian said i think it's really really important that we have this debate and we talk about um, are artists getting paid fairly and what can we do to kind of resolve this and sort this out? Um, I was looking at the IPO um, creator earnings report that came out and like looking at that research that was done looking into how creators make money from um, streaming and they said that um, kind of a benchmark would be about a million streams a month for artists to kind of earn a, a living off of that. But only 720 UK artists achieved that in 2020. Um, and then I think there's a real issue with income concentration, which I wanted to raise as well. I feel like, um, again, from the IPO research, um, uh, 1%, um, the top 1% receive 80% of all the streams and the top 0.1% receive 40% of all the streams. So um, I think from myself coming from that background of really, you know, just to give some background on myself, you know, talking about uh, managing artists, but I managed independent artists, particularly in the field of crime. And that as a genre was something that wasn't really supported by the mainstream music industry when I was starting out. So we really had to find our own lanes and our own path and our own audience and market directly to them. So um, I found that, you know, again, within that top 0.1% on, on streaming platforms, um, nine out of 10 of those are signed to majors. So, you know, I think there is some disparity in terms of like how independent artists, and especially how emerging artists can kind of tap into that. And going on from that, I think, you know, there's a breadth of opportunities available to artists and anybody that wants to release music, or anyone can release music nowadays. You know, it's something like 60,000 tracks are uploaded daily to Spotify. But the issue or the challenge nowadays is not not who can release music and the kind of getting past those gatekeepers and only those, you know, signed to major labels or only those that get radio support can, can release music, everyone can. But the challenge nowadays is like, how do you compete with not just those 60,000 tracks, but you're now competing with that back catalog of every single song ever made. So I really welcome the debate. And um, for me, I think it's about um, looking at all the different models that have been proposed and suggested, but working out and understanding what are the impacts and who do they actually benefit um, um, and who are the actual winners and losers out of each of those. And I know, you know, rightly so, there's a lot of passion behind a lot of the campaigns. And I think it's been great because they've brought this conversation to the forefront and we're now talking about it and we're having debates about it. And, you know, there's the, the research has been done and, and everything. I think that's so important, but I think we need to have more modeling done to kind of work out 
who are the winners and losers in this because my concern is you know like you mentioned you know running women in control I've done a lot of research into how female musicians are or aren't supported or don't get enough support or played or negatively impacted by algorithms on streaming platforms or aren't played enough on, on on radio and my concern is how you know some of these models are proposed that how they actually impact some of those um, minorities thank you very much now graham as uh someone who's working in licensing i mean you've worked in various different parts of the industry of course over the years but from a licensing perspective at the moment you're working with various different platforms all the major platforms and and many that some of us haven't even heard of yet um and probably will in the future and this is the thing because it's emerging and shifting all the time um so there's obviously the pro rata model well not obviously some people aren't aware of this like my mom wouldn't know this for example that there's a pro rata model of streaming and then there's obviously the user-centric model which is you know bank camp and whatnot over the last two or three years, what sort of shifts have you sort of noted or noticed in, in your particular part of the industry? Um, I think uh, I think the um, the growing kind of attention paid to um, proportional payments is very interesting. Um, while I was on the way over here, I think there was a press release from Tidal saying they're looking at uh, at uh, per play direct. Sorry, I've completely forgotten the phrase to <laughs> describe it. Paper stream? Yes, paper stream. Um, SoundCloud have um, looked at that a little as well in the past, I believe. Um, I think there's a fundamental question around that model, which I struggle with, which is, is the value of a piece of music attached to how many times you want to listen to it? Because I think there's a ton of really important um, art and music which is challenging you know you're not going to listen to it every morning but like some music is you know kind of some music is fixed to a very specific context like for example like take pal like one of the big tracks from that is that like that's a great track in certain situations but i'm not sticking it on on a sunday morning <laughs> so yeah i think when we when we um consider the value of music to be linked to its um, to its ease of use, if you like. Yeah. I'm not sure that's always the correct model. I, I'm inclined to agree with that. There's a huge gradient in, in all of these things, never mind you know which platform we're talking about. It's like getting into the nitty gritty of specific elements of platforms. And you, know, you could be on a panel for 10 hours and barely skim the surface. But I am curious to think, Ian, what you reckon about PPS as an approach and whether it could be integrated into buying albums and support musicians in the likes of uh, Spotify, for example. Like, it, there, there is part of me that feels like we are jumping the, the gun and even discussing this in the sense that to me, like the, the sort of mode of delivery is secondary almost to the way in which the fundamental economics function and the you know the slice of the slicing of the pie in terms of say a Spotify situation, um, where the song receives fourteen percent, label receives fifty two, Spotify get the rest. Um, I've, I I I literally want to ask the question: Why are we doing this? Um, is Spotify not as much broadcast as it is? Uh, as it is records and in that sense how are we functioning off the make and available right the right that, that Spotify pays out on the basis of was legally established in 2002 Spotify started streaming as the first streaming service in 2008 so streaming didn't exist when make and available was established and so and it, there's a there's an awful lot of power behind this that is holding an archaic uh, separation of the economics um, in place when the overheads have been obliterated for record labels. And, and really, we have to ask the question, where do the musical performers on tracks, why are they not re remunerated um, when that's, that is the case? Why, why is it that the... The uh, songwriting uh, side of the 
income from streaming is perform 50 percent performance 50 percent uh, mechanical but then on the label side we have a situation where it's just 100 percent mechanical there's no performance right for uh non-featured performers to be honest i think it's it's just a mess and before we even get into what what mode of delivery should we have or should we should people pay for an individual track or should we do this we actually need to look at the fundamental way that the whole uh economic pie is, is divided um and and i think and i think also we have to go to google and tell them to just sort youtube out because i i think the conversation is also kind of redundant when the highest streaming service provider is is paying out 27 times what you get for a play on youtube like how can that you can't expect uh, Spotify to raise their prices. You can't, you can't expect any of these things to move until there's some kind of legislation that demands that Google, and also the Google kind of safe harbors, we in, in terms of YouTube, like all of these issues are very. It might seem subtle on the outside, but they have very, very strong suppression of all the things that we want to see happen, and we need government movement on that. I think. Uh, it, it it has to kind of move beyond um and, and but but i tell you what if if we saw the majors actually stand up and join that voice things could move very very quickly but but there's a lot of dead air in that sense too you know absolutely and a lot of that's inaccessible to consumers and audiences they you know they'll read a news story about for example your involvement and their participation in that is almost null. How do you all propose that you know audiences can get involved in the conversation um, as you know active participants rather than passive consumers? I mean, it, it, sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. I'll hand over to you guys. It's incredibly hard because, as you can see, I'm trying to kind of talk about it, and it is kind of labyrinthine in terms of the levels. It's so it's complex for me to get my head around and i've been working in it for um decades it's it, so that's been the, that's the challenge in terms of having the kind of broader conversation i think is that that when you try to engage general public in it people can switch off very very easily i think yeah i, th I agree with you and i think a big challenge as well like you said it, it's so complex and there's so many different layers and it so many different stakeholders involved as well getting the public involved and kind of breaking down the problems and then also discussing the solutions in a rational way. But I feel like you have to get, you know, with the broken record campaign, you've had to get the public behind you to that. And that's what's driven that campaign and got it the attention and, and made this conversation be brought to the forefront. Um, but then, you know, sometimes you can't have rational conversations within that because there is a lot of emotion, passion, it's people's livelihood, it's people's careers and people are coming from all different perspectives. So it is really challenging. I think for me, I think sometimes in the industry, I feel like we sometimes want a one solution fits all. And I don't think that that's right. And that's the, I don't think that's the answer. And I've kind of, within this whole kind of debate, always taken a step back because I like to assess, I like to look at all the facts consider everybody's perspective and my own experience, but not make a decision based on my own kind of experiences, but what's right, because it is a bit of a mess, to be honest. So, you know, what is the right answer? You know, so I'm looking at, you know, ER, for example, and saying, is that the solution? But <clears throat> in each of the models, there's some winners and there's some losers. So, you know, from my research or what I've seen that's been put out there from some of the modeling that's done, you know, ER is going to mean that artists potentially get four to six percent extra in their pockets but then if they have session musicians on then that could be reduced so is that enough is that enough of a solution er um is going to favor or definitely help and support um major label artists that have been signed to major label contracts or legacy contracts um or those that have been on kind of less than 16 percent before so my concern is where you know how does that impact emerging artists and upcoming talent and you know what what is the right solutions for them and personally i also feel like we need to look at the contracts 
you know, like you said, there's, there's a whole mess in, in the industry. But what is the cause of this? What's the root and cause of this is that the, the contracts haven't been fair in the first place. So from my perspective and working, you know, as an independent um, business owner, I do mar management and consultancy, but I'm really about educating artists um, with the business knowledge. And like I said at the start, I think artists now have a breadth of choice available to them. I'm sure we'll go into that a little bit of kind of, you know, how they can release music. They, they don't have to just go through a major label or be signed. They can Put it up, you know, on their own dist distributor platforms, take label services, or go by by via some of these other routes. So they've got that choice, and I think it's just about educating artists and rights holders to say these are all the options out there. But then going back to what I said, just fixing the contracts in the first place and putting more pressure on labels to 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 right those wrongs. Thank you. Um, go on. A couple of points, sir. Um, one, I. 100% agree with the idea that we're incredibly reductive with how we talk about artists. The idea that artists are some kind of solid block is rubbish. Right? There, are, there are winners and losers um, in very different ways across very different platforms. Um, second point, to talk about um, incentivizing major labels and major rights holders to become part of these conversations. I am unsure how to do that when the value of those companies and the value of frontline music rights is going through the roof over the last 18 months or so, there is not a lot of incentive for very successful businesses to you know, consider changing their business model. Um, finally, um, with regards to engaging the general public, um, I feel that as an industry, um, we, the music industry, tends to have a habit of overestimating the importance of music to the general public. I think mean, everyone who works in the music industry is incredibly passionate and incredibly engaged with what they're doing and what they're listening to. I'm not sure that's necessarily reflected in the, in the general public. People like music, but I'm not sure it's necessarily something that, you know, kind of that really fires them up when we're talking about economic redistribution. You mean the man in the street sort of thing as opposed to... Yeah, I guess what we would have called in the 90s the kind of the supermarket CD shopper. Okay. Someone who buys four albums a year. That kind of... The genie's out the bottle on that one now. Now anyone can have access to the entirety of recorded music, more or less, for 10 quid a month. Yeah. Measuring that is obviously tricky, but that's something you... It's an instinctive thing almost. You, know, you can measure it obviously financially, but you know, what do you measure it against? Film, other mediums of entertainment? I mean, you know, I'd say most people in this room would say they love music, but you know, you could walk around to a coffee shop and have that conversation. It's how it reflects and manifests and affects the overall economy and how that spreads out. It's inscrutable and probably unknowable, but you know, it's a very good point. Now, other services obviously exist. It's not just streaming. It's not just Bandcamp versus Spotify and all the rest. There's many other ways to monetize your career as an independent and established artist online. And a lot of us, you know, discovered that over lockdown. Um, Ian, what are your thoughts on that? You know, because there is this obsession with streaming now and, you know, record shops are opening back up. But there, there is always ways to make money that isn't, you know, paying a subscription every month. Or going into like HMV or you know more reputable stores. Do you mean in terms of how do artists make money from recorded music? The, the, in, in more inventive ways to do that. Well, you know, without the live industry functioning, you know, obviously you're an established artist, but you can see the bigger picture. Over the last two or three years, you know, live streaming was a huge thing, and I know certain people in the room here, for example, who have, you know kind of made some money off that but they couldn't you know it wasn't a living wage is there are there ways to do that do you think that doesn't rely on spotify or all these platforms i mean there are certainly yeah there are ways of kind of you know direct to fan and and people subscribing to you as an artist um at, at patreon you know Bandcamp. there's a lot of opportunities um to to you know, on on whatever scale you can make it work, um, create some kind of revenue from from your work for sure, and 
there are great opportunities in terms of reaching the world, in terms of social media, and, and getting your work out there. If if you're my my issue with that, I think is that I see a lot of artists who's who, who are very musically gifted, but their they their sort of skill set is being deviated, like like being pushed. Like they, they could make incredibly brilliant art, but really what they become is great kids entertainers on online. And that that really saddens me. It's sort of like, um, and that's what they've got to do to draw attention to the, to the music that they want to present. And in a way it kind of brings you back. That's why artists need that investment and need labels and labels need artists and yeah, we can circumvent. There's a reason why the whole thing exists. It's it's brilliant. <laughs> like it's 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 an exciting, great, really. Uh, you, you know that whole side, the industry side, is great. There are opportunities to totally uh, work around it, but I genuinely believe in engaging in it um, too. So, but but I think I, because I think it does. There is a concern that as an artist, when you do try to do those things, you, you do all manner of stuff to try to draw attention to your work, when really you should be making great records and playing great shows. Um, I actually I think a panel in streaming three or four years ago. At, I think it was Output. Somebody said the exact same thing, and I, I really enjoyed that. It was like, you know, focus on your craft and actually try to be the best you can be. And that ties in with what Graham was saying as well about the, you know, the love of music. And, you know, that's a whole different story. You know, we're not just talking about business. We're talking about impetus and, you know, where this whole thing comes from. Um, I'm curious to think, Nadia, how you feel about the, you know, monetization is incredibly important. You know, no one's going to be a musician for free for no reason. Motivation is survival. But career development, and this is something that you, you know, like the ins and outs of working with various different people. If we use the example of Women in Control, the farm that you have there that's dedicated to advice and, and actually connecting these individuals with the, the wider world of career development, how does that tie in with the overall online music economy beyond streaming? Do you mean for artists or do you mean for people behind the scenes? For, art, for artists specifically, yeah. <clears throat> um, yeah, I think I just go back to, I think the education part of it is really important. And I guess, you know, <clears throat> just a bit of background on my or a bit of you know my own experiences kind of running independent labels and releasing music independently with my artists in grime and just not having any success on on radio or not having been able to get that support and this we're talking say pow we're talking 2004 so so is my age but like 17 years ago <laughs> so, <Sweet>. yeah <laughs> but you know we didn't have social media we didn't have YouTube, we didn't have any avenues by which we could push our, the music out. And then that record um, that you don't want to listen to on a Sunday morning, um, also, you know, councils across the whole of the UK banned it and clubs put signs up saying this record is too energetic. Well, they, they said, we do not play this record, do not request it. So another, <laughs> and we don't even play the instrumental that was, a sign, that was on the sign as well. So we had a big avenue to kind of promoting music kind of pulled from us. So it was a real struggle to kind of get out there. So we had to seek other avenues and other ways in order to kind of have success. Um, and that route was for, for Bizzle. My artist was to kind of go down the indie route and kind of get into Club Enemy where mosh pitting and having that reaction wasn't deemed um, a, an issue or a problem. So we kind of found and sought that out. Um, and then later on in, in, our, in our careers, when we figured out we weren't getting support from major labels or that investment um, that we felt that we should be getting when we were speaking to labels, the conversation was, you know, grime's a very niche genre. Your audience is London, Birmingham, Manchester. At the most, you're not going to get more than that. And we felt that it was more than that. And we felt we had a bigger fan base outside of that. So we started a clothing brand um, kind of when Twitter started out that grew from a word that Bizzle just made up, Dench, that just blew up online, went viral. We created a clothing brand out of that. And, you know, just that's where it feeds into. I thought you were just thinking I didn't answer your question. No, no, you, you really are answering. <laughs> yeah. No, <laughs> no, but basically we created this clothing brand and we set up our own store. And then we were able to see 
exactly where our fan base was and have control and power and authority ourselves to make decisions and market directly to our fans. And we realized that, hold on, our fans are in London, Birmingham, Manchester. They're all over the UK and they're international. They're in Australia. So that gave us the power to be able to kind of take control of our career and uh, our path. And I think that's something that I take into kind of any artist that I speak to. You know, I teach the um, MMF Essential Music Management course as well to kind of show that journey, to show how, you know, important education is and learning and that resilience and having that understanding and that knowledge of the business is what is gonna help guide you. And that's what I try and do with Women in Control. And I want to bridge that gap because myself in the industry, I always felt like an outsider in the industry. I didn't feel supported by the industry. I did it myself. I got successful myself. And then when I got successful, the industry were like, oh, come here. <laughs> we want we want you. So um, now I'm a part of the industry. I feel like I have my experiences that I can help to bridge that gap and make sure that um, you know, people from disadvantaged backgrounds like, like myself or people from ethnic minority backgrounds or or women, you know, as you mentioned with Women in Control, I do extensive research. And from my own experiences being a woman in the industry, I know that women get paid um, less and get treated unfairly. And female musicians do as well. You know, the top 10 female songwriters earned 70, 70, 70% less than the top 10 male songwriters in 2019. Um, so, you know, these issues do exist. So that's what I try and do is I kind of bring my experience and knowledge and try and bring that education to um, anybody that's coming through. Because I think that education and knowledge is going to be vital to making the right decision for you because there's a breadth of choices and options out there, but you have to make the right one for you. Very, very well said. That was quite inspiring, actually. Uh, thank you very much. Um, Graham, you know, Song Trader are, as I've said at the start, like the largest uh, business to business uh, platform with licensing in the world for artists, but you're dealing with many independent artists there. I'd say the vast majority of them probably be independent. Uh, yeah, predominantly. I think it's predominantly independent artists and DIY artists. Okay. Um, so I think there's a, there's a distinction there mm. in terms of uh, artists signed to a small uh, independent label and DIY artists who are literally doing everything themselves. Yeah. That is, that is definitely a distinction. And on your website, you know, I've noticed there's a lot of good testimonials. You know, you go on websites, you know, music companies, and there's, you can tell some of them aren't real or they're just, <laughs> or they're just doing it because they feel like they have to. But there is some genuine insight from individuals. You can tell that it's uh, working for them. Have you seen anything uh, or experienced anything in your line of work that has inspired you or, or made you think that, you know, maybe we are on the right track? Um, yeah, I think, I mean, to Nadia's point about education, um, I started off in the industry in 2005, 2006, and the level of um, industry awareness, just business sense in artists now is like leagues further advanced from where it was back then. That's really, really encouraging. Like it's a, it's a lot harder to, uh, to rip off an artist now, I think. <laughs> yeah, some people give it a go all the same um, yes yeah, standard I'm speaking from experience here as well um, so PPL uh, for example and and you know other Royal TBS companies you know that there's encouragement for them to you know get behind the paper stream sort of model and to actually you know incentivize that sort of world uh, the CEO from PPL is actually in the room here today in the front row Peter Latham hopefully pressure. maybe a few words um, from Peter afterwards we'll see how you get on um, but I'm curious, like, you know, I would like to hear this from all of you if possible, but to start with Graham, how do you think that could be incorporated into the, the bigger picture? Um, I would turn my attention to PRS and PROs in particular. I think it's a striking feature of a lot of the conversations around streaming platforms and UGC platforms that PRS has the mandate to agree the licensing rates with those platforms. Um, I think it's pretty clear that the songwriter community and the, uh, the publishing community um, is really struggling with the revenue it's seeing from those platforms. And a lot of uh, fury and uh, scrutiny is directed in those platforms direction. Some of it justified, but I do feel there needs to be a conversation about, and I'm not just singling out PRS, this is a global situation. With PROs in different territories, 
there does need to be a conversation about, well, you're empowered to negotiate on the behalf of publishers and songwriters, and you don't appear to be doing a great job. Why is that? That's a great question. I wish there was someone from PRS here, but that was uh, waiting from the outside. <laughs> totally. Um, maybe next year, there, you know, there, there often is someone from PRS that they think so. Maybe come back. Ian, what do you think about this in question? Uh, you know, to pick up on that, like, I think you only need to look at the kind of board structure of PRS to kind of recognize that um, there is influence that is not directly from the song. What, what songwriters, what creators would like to happen to PRS is a far cry from what actually happens at PRS. Um, so I think there, there have been and there are questions, there are ongoing questions to be asked about that. Um, I continue to ask them. Uh, and uh, I think that's where I come back to some fundamentals again. It's like, what are we actually doing? What shape? What is the fundamental shape of this whole thing underneath the fabric of it? Who's who's pulling the strings and what what is happening and why why is this whole thing set up the way it is? Like we are allowed as creators to ask that question. And I think you will find, and I've watched, like you only need to watch the DCMS inquiry footage to watch m crazy levels of obfuscation from everybody pretty much who's not an artist to represent than an artist. It's just obfuscate, obfuscate, obfuscate because there's a system that serves that, that serves certain people. It serves labels because they get a massive chunk of this pie. And of course they want to preserve that. And you're absolutely right in the sense that why, you know, why would they come to the table? Because they're, you know, that there's huge earnings and Lucian Grange is getting 150 million and, and we're in this situation. But actually, come on, sit down and look at how we're set up. I'm talking about 10, 20 years down the line. And as much as we want really inventive, um, like Nadia's talking about, like that's so inspiring to hear about um, artists coming from the fringes and coming in and being inventive and like it's, it's 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 such a great story and we want more of that i also want like the people who want to invest in artists to invest in artists long term not just that artist but but long term careers and more and more infrastructure so that we can see the industry grow stronger the uk music industry is it's way above its weight like it's insane if we want to keep that going the reason why there's an outcry right now is that there's a fundamental problem you can't obfuscate your way through it gotta to come to the table and sit down and talk about it um and we can dance around all the other issues but it really does come down to that for me you know i totally agree i think it's you know it's fundamentally capitalism i think and then it's what's what's stemmed from that ultimately isn't it yeah, and and but there is a reason why government is, um, you know, clearly like DCMS are making a report that is calling for massive change in the industry. Like we have to sort of, you know, and everybody in the industry is kind of run, who's who's in any other position is is sort of trying to sort of, you know, change the subject, but people in government have scrutinised the way this industry works and have said we need to start again like that the report says start again pretty much it's about clear the decks and rebuild this thing like if government they're saying you know if, if if parliament is telling us that um it's a little bit hard to justify why nobody's coming to the table to talk about it i think that's true actually um when if it's governmentally uh, authenticated and people aren't sort of following suit you know there's something up definitely i fully agree um so i think the term was reset button or, or along those lines yeah. nadia um you know from the outside looking in from that point of view you know in in that world not just streaming but the the all these models that are interlinked how would you reset it if you had the magic wand um i think like i said earlier i think with all the models i want to see 
how they plan out what what's what are the implications you know we have to do some more forecasting i want to see the different models side by side and understand what does that mean for artist a or artist b or somebody signed to a major or somebody that's emerging and i think um as ian said at the start i think there is enough willingness and want in the industry to change um and there are a lot of organizations and um, stakeholders that are part of that conversation. But I just think it's about us kind of galvanizing and getting more of that knowledge about the long-term effects and the consequences and what is a good outcome. Um, and we don't have that information yet. And I think that's the next step. I agree. Knowledge is power. And we are still in the early sort of uh, inception of that sort of uh, that, that world. Um, Last week or the week before, I was on Twitter and I noticed a tweet about a grassroots streaming, user-centric streaming company called Minim, M-I-N-M, -M, and it had a soft launch this week. So as I said, it's grassroots, it's user-centric, and it's a streaming site that pays artists fairly and transparently. There's um, two uh, founders, one in Belfast and one in Dublin, so it's an all-Ireland affair. And they're designed specifically for smaller independent artists. So a subscription of five euro, this isn't an advertisement by the way, it's just, it's really, it's it's early days, but it sounds like it could be very promising for artists wanting to follow the band camp model in Ireland. So it's five euro a month or four pound 30. And 90% goes to artists. Um, it, it asks the question, why does, you know, streaming pay the least when it's the most dominant? It's the classic. Do we think that that is a viable, model uh, you know to be able to progress from a grassroots thing into something bigger considering uh, the market leaders I'd like to ask Graham that question and I'd like to provide a positive answer <laughs> <laughs> um, I am skeptical to be fair I think that when you are creating a platform purely for emerging artists there's um, it's definitely a question of like, how much traffic you can attract. Um, I think Bandcamp's proven that that can work. Um, but Bandcamp as a platform is also getting to a point where there is so much content on there that it's increasingly hard to manage. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm sympathetic <laughs> to that model. Okay. Um, but, but within the confines of Ireland, if it was, you know, if they, if they stress the point that it was... Uh, a national thing. I mean, this is just an example of you know potential emerging platforms like that. Yeah, I think um, for me personally, um, I think taking pride in a local scene is really important, um, particularly when it's as um, as kind of compact as the one over here. Uh, the idea of a kind of nationalistic tilt on a streaming platform gives me makes me slightly queasy. <laughs> not nationalistic, not like. <laughs> we don't do that uh, but yeah I understand I really admire your honesty though but I have full faith I think Luke maybe from Minim's here and you know I I, I think I will definitely <laughs> he's here tonight uh, I don't know if he is but if you want to raise your hand there he is Luke how are you doing would you like to say a few words Luke Yeah, no, I mean, that's the million dollar question. We are pessimistic ourselves as well. It's something that we don't know if it will work, but I think the reality is, is that what we currently have does not work. So our kind of mentality is that whatever streaming is at the moment, it's working for the top 1% or that like, you know, top 4% that, or 0.4% that gets 40% um, of the streams. It clearly is not working for everyone else in this room because nobody here is making a living off streaming. So, you know, that ultimately has to change. How it changes, we don't know. But what we do know is that there isn't a streaming solution that is built for any of these people. Like, you know, any artist that is not pulling in, um, you know, millions of streams a month. And I think something that you said earlier that I, you know, has been like just kicking in the back of my head, like really rings with me that, there's kind of two main problems with the way um, the model works at the moment is that music is valued just by the sheer volume of streams, which is ridiculous because, you know, that's just some arbitrary kind of metric. You're not going to be listening to 
some lo-fi ambient experimental noise, you know, the you know, 20 times in the car on the way over to a priest, right? You know, that doesn't make any sense. And second of all, is 10 euro a month or 10 pounds a month worth the music that you listen to? Because the whole question about what is music worth really needs to be rethought because streaming was invented as an answer to piracy. Before streaming, you went out and you bought albums. And that's, you know, eight pounds an album or whatever. Um, if you think about the number of artists you listen to in a year, you probably listen to, I don't know, maybe 50 or 60, but you don't buy probably, you know, 60 or 70 albums. Or if you do, that's great. I mean, support your artists. But all of a sudden now we're seeing that the amount of money that people spend on music is about, you know, 10, like 10 pounds a month over the course of a year. 120 pounds a year to listen to all the music that you do. And this is just kind of assuming that you mainly listen to music via streaming. I think that's insanely little. I think 120 pounds for you know all the artists that have kind of you know given you the music that you listen to doing your work, uh, whether you're sitting at home relaxing, whether you're kind of playing at a party or whatever, all that kind of like you know enjoyment and value you get out of that. I think it's, we personally think it is worth more than 120 pounds a year. But yeah, we don't know what the solution is. We think that this kind of user centric payment system seems promising, but it is, you know, we don't have the evidence yet to say that it works, but that's, I guess, where we're headed at. We want to find out if it works. And it's not a technological problem. It's an economic problem that is not very hard for us to try and make this website. So, yeah, that's kind of where we're at. Thank you very much, Luke. Appreciate that. Um, that's encouraging, I think, from what, you know, what he's just said. He started off saying it was pessimistic. You know, you're pessimistic, but I'm, I'm hearing pragmatic there. You're seeing, you're seeing the reality of the situation, but you really want to push through and make it work. And I, and I know, Lynn, you mentioned Joel Harkin at the start of the stream. I think he may have been involved in sort of like, you know, spearheading it from an artist's perspective. So much respect to him. So as we've established, there's a million and one things that we could talk about in, in relation to streaming, never mind the online music market and industry generally. But to end on, you know, hopefully optimistic sort of like, we don't have to force optimism, but there are reasons to be cheerful and reasons to be optimistic. I think if we consider, you know, 2025, if we, look, if we can look into that crystal ball individually, what is the ideal environment, a realistically ideal environment for all the things that we've talked about? In a, in a line or two? I, you know, the, the positive side of this is, you know, I'm talking to it, like label, bosses of labels, big labels that are in regular, this like, this is conversation. We, this needs to change, like things are changing and we recognize that. So in a way, even internally, it's not, uh, it's not, um, some kind of drawing factions or drawing lines. It's a work together, push to somewhere new. Oh, recognize that there's an issue. You know, people have to raise their voice to sort of raise an issue. So that's that's that, that's what that's about. Um, and so I think things will improve. It might take time, actually. You know, I think that's the recognition when I'm talking to uh, pe people at those levels. There's a sense of look. I think this is going to take a bit of time, and I think that there there are some big adjustments here. Even if the small adjustments are really big adjustments, uh, and so um, th that's that's gonna you know it's going to take a bit of time to readjust. And in during that time, certainly us at, at, at the Ivers have to continue to to um, speak up on this and encourage everybody here if. If uh, right, right, you know we have we have the private members bill, um, which is being read. Um, no, Kevin Brennan's reading private members bill on the third of December, and I would encourage you to uh, write your MP in support of it, um, that because that that has got it, that is constantly moving the dial in terms of keep, keeping this in the public eye and the public frame, engaging people in debate, keeping this conversation alive and as the and, and we have the chance actually in legislation to move things forward. So um, I'd encourage you to write your MP support that. And um, we're going the right way, like we're talking about the right things. Absolutely. We're not going backwards. Nadia, what do you think? 
Um, I think a positive thing out of all of this is that it, you know, this all breeds innovation, like, you know, Luke coming up with the Minim and that, that you know, coming up with a new platform and trying out things. And I think that's one positive thing that comes out of this is there is going to be innovation. There's going to be new technology. There's going to be new models that people are, and artists and uh, managers and rights holders are going to be trying out and working out. So I think that's the future. You know, the future is there, there could be a new streaming platform, a new Spotify, a new technology that's going to come and take over all that. And then just echoing what Ian said as well, I think the fact that we're having these conversations and I feel like there's starting to be a more open dialogue. So I would hope that we yeah. can have more rational dialogue and talk about this and with, you know, that long term view of what the implications, what are the consequences and who are the winners and losers and making sure that, you know, we don't just prioritize just you know white men over the age of 40 that we think about diversity and and women and female musicians within that as well very well said uh graham your candor and conviction has been a delight i i'm a big fan and i'd like you to continue that way if possible thanks <laughs> um i was i would look at the last decade and say that that was the start of the the diy revolution for a lot of artists a lot of artists uh, different levels in their career, decided that it was the right time to, you know, kind of maintain ownership of their rights. And um, how can I put it? And, um, and present and market their music in the way they wanted to. I think that in the next decade, or this decade rather, that's going to accelerate in terms of how people choose to, um, choose to distribute their music in terms of what platforms they're on. Um, I've really consciously strayed away from talking about web free and things like that today because there's so much bug-eyed zealotry around it and very little rational discussion. But it does feel that, you know, right now those, those technologies and those systems are heading somewhere interesting. They're not there yet. The barrier to entry is way too elitist and way too exclusionary right now. But there's the germ of something very, very interesting in there. And I think the impact that could have on independent artists in particular and the implications that has for the relationship they have with their audience and the ownership of that relationship, that's really, really exciting. Absolutely. All very promising things there to sort of wrap it up. Do we have any time for questions? Is anyone desperate to ask a question? Nope. Peter, have you any inclination to say anything regarding? Yes, can you do the mic? Thank you. No, no. Sorry, it wasn't me. Um, yeah, no, hi. I think the um, one of the points I made when I was giving evidence was quite funny actually, because Kevin Brennan I know quite well, and then you start off, he questioned me as if he'd never met me. And so it throws you off your guard a little bit. But uh, one of the things I was trying to point out was a bit like what Ian was saying was um, actually if you look at uh, things like YouTube, which is uh, in the US in 2019 was 53% of all streaming, but 7% of the value, um, there was a bit of an issue there. And obviously we'd worked as an industry collectively very hard to get the value gap addressed through Europe. And because of Brexit, the government was no longer going to implement in the UK. And so trying to make those points, actually, there is a while there's some uh, internal discussions to be had about how we spread the money among songwriters, composers, performers, record companies, publishers, etc. There was an overall value issue in terms of the industry because uh, we're still 20 years on. We're only in real terms value for recorded music, two thirds of the value it was 20 years ago. And so then you're trying to share with 20 years extra back catalogue. Um, and I think I made the point also in 2019, two of the top 10 selling best albums in the world were Abbey Road by the Beatles because of the 50th anniversary and then Bohemian Rhapsody by Queen. So if you're a new artist coming because of the film, if you're a you new know, artist coming along, you've got another 20 years of um, back catalogue to compete with going back to 1963 when we got copyright. Um, and yet the, the overall value you're sharing is two thirds of what it was in real terms 20 years ago. So, and that was where, again, trying to look at government, and I, I know we've come out of Brexit and they don't want to follow European laws, et cetera, but there was something there that was quite important and is, is something the industry does need some help on to allow it to, sort of, to get a better sort of playing field in terms of trying to extract value for the use of music when companies are doing rather well commercially out of that. So that was, I was trying to focus on those bits there, really, in terms of the overall uh, dialogue and discussion. And then, yeah, I think, you know, confirming to Kevin, as they were asking if, 
if there was going to be uh, an ER right for performers in streaming, then yeah, then PPL would hopefully have a, a role to play there. Because, you know, we're going to, this quarter will pay 100,000 performers on, you know, some hundreds of thousands of recordings. And I think you know, we're already doing something there. I know streaming is a higher value, higher numbers, et cetera, but there's probably something we could do there just to expand our operations into ER if that was something that, that came along. And I think there are quite tangible steps, actually, because um, obviously we had a select committee report identifying a need for a lot of change. That's trying to influence governments thinking on what they're going to do next. But actually having the CMA now doing a market investigation is quite a formal step in terms of doing something a bit more robust to look at everything. Um, and uh, so that'd be interesting to see where that, where that all goes, actually. So. Absolutely. Thank you very much, Peter. That's provisionally very encouraging news to anybody who signed up to PPL or, and similar uh, organizations. So we're out of time. I want to thank our fantastic panel today and thank everyone else here. And I'm, I'm just going to say, I, I don't work for Minim, but I think sign up for Minim. I think that's what we're basically concluding with today. Thank you very much. Is it on? Yeah, it is. Um, so first of all, thank you to the panelists that we've just had. Um, I think the caliber of speakers and experience that we've had this afternoon so far has just been absolutely fantastic. So I want to thank them all for their time and I want to thank Peter for his impromptu um, contribution there and to reel those stats off the top of your head like that was very impressive. Um, so thank you all. Um, I appreciate you all being here still at this time of the day. I know you might want to get out and get a bit of fresh air, but I would really encourage you to come back for the, the last and, and final session of this afternoon, which, as I said in my opening, if you were here for that, it could be perhaps the most important panel of all today. It focuses on your health, your health, whether that's you as a musician or someone that you know working in music. There are services here to help you to have that healthy career in music. And so we'd ask you to come back at, let's say, four, five past four for the last panel um, of more great speakers. And uh, yeah, we'll look forward to seeing you then. But thanks again. And thanks to these guys. Brilliant.